This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They, and I it felt, felt I right. Right. And I, was so and I just thought, well, I figured it, out. I it was that home. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hi everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. This week's story is from Aviva Hope Rutkin. The story was recorded in August 2013 at Oberon in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as part of a partnership with WBUR. The theme of the evening was Small Things. All right, when some people hear that I'm a graduate student at MIT, they think I must be doing huge, world-changing stuff, you know, inventing the next internet, curing a disease, building the robot that'll eventually take all of your jobs. Um, but me, no, I spent all my time in graduate school obsessing over one man who most people have never even heard of. That wasn't my intention. I had big dreams, too. I was going to go into the science writing program, bring science to the scientifically illiterate, make it accessible and human and interesting, and if along the way I become a famous and beloved writer and mortalize my name forever, so be it. Um, I'm especially interested in kind of weird, offbeat inventions. Um, I wanted to do my thesis in the beginning on this thing called sensory substitution, Uh, which is this really elegant idea that we can build devices that actually change the way our senses take in information and thereby change the way that our brain perceives the world. And that sounds kind of far out, and some of it is. Like there's these weirdos who implant magnets under their fingertips to try to feel the fields of the earth. Um, But there's simple examples too. Uh, Sign language even is a kind of sensory substitution, taking something that's usually auditory and making it visual. Uh, Or Braille, where you take something that you usually see and turn it into touch. But the woman who runs my program is kind of old school and wasn't convinced that this was real science so much as some kind of singularity bullshit that I dreamed up one night. And she told me I had to go to the library and find some evidence. So I spent a bunch of Saturdays paging through books, dozens of scientific articles, doing that old kind of Wikipedia trick where you look at the citations and you just figure out where to go next from there. And I realize I keep seeing this kind of exotic name, Bach e Rita, uh, Bach dash Y dash Rita, like two names, you know? And I'm like, man, who is this guy? He's everywhere. So I welcome a distraction. I do what people of my generation have been taught to do, start Googling him like crazy to figure it out. And I find all these newspaper articles from like the late 90s, early 2000s. And uh, they describe him as unique and innovative and visionary. And he's building this, he's the father of the field. And he's building this kind of magnum opus device that's like like an electric lollipop. You put it on your tongue and uh, little electrodes will buzz there. And it um, takes the world around you and puts it in little shapes, like pixels on a screen. And Bakibita had this crazy idea that what he was going to do is have blind people wear these all around. Instead of having a cane or a guide dog, you just have your little electric retainer. And every article says, oh, this is coming out really soon, but it didn't, of course it didn't. I feel like I would have heard of blind people walking around with this in their mouth. And in fact, as I'm reading, I realize Baki Rita kind of just disappears from public memory after like 2003. I mean, first of all, I can't even figure out if he was born in America or Mexico because all, all the articles are mixing it up. I find his company website, which is totally stark, barely even mentions his name. I call up the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he worked for the last 23 years of his life, and ask him if they have anything on file, and they just send me a single obituary. Okay. But now I'm fixated, right? This is 
this is a curiosity that doesn't care about getting actual work done. I start emailing his colleagues, demanding to know where this man is and what happens. One guy finally responds to me. He says, you should call Bakibira's widow. Here's her cell phone number. <laughs> That's when I start getting nervous. You know, like being a reporter is just being really fucking nosy. And I start having, I put it off for days because I'm having these dreams. That I call Esther up and she yells at me in Spanish, like, leave me alone. Why are you demanding to know about my dead husband? But I do call her because I'm brave and also because my advisor wanted to see that I was doing something. And she didn't answer to my relief, and I leave this kind of garbled message explaining who I am and what I'm doing, and does your husband have any files, maybe papers he left to a library or museum or something? Please call me back. Thanks. Bye. And she calls me back later that day, and she says, yeah, my husband had files, 25 boxes or so, and he was working on memoirs when he died, and they're all in the basement of my house. And she says, if you're ever in Wisconsin, you should come stay with me and I'll let you see them. So, two months later, middle of January, I am on a plane to Madison, Wisconsin, shaking with fear. I spend my entire graduate school stipend that they give me renting a Ford Fiesta. <laughs> I should tell you I'm a terrible driver to begin with, and I'm so nervous about this whole thing that I get pulled over within the first 20 minutes of driving it <laughs> for having my high beams on. And then five minutes later, I get pulled over again <laughs> by the same cop <laughs> for still having my high beams on. And he gives me this little pamphlet the second time called How the Police Can Help You. <laughs> but now, actually, I feel kind of relieved because when you're nervous, you're waiting for something bad to happen, for things to go off the rails, and they already have. So I'm home free. Nine at night, I finally pull up to Esther's house, this little place on top of a hill in the suburbs, and I open the door, and suddenly she's there, and her daughter, uh, the youngest of Bakibita's four daughters, Andrea, just a couple of years older than me, and they're scooping up cats, and they're offering me slippers, and did I have anything to eat, and they take me to this room, which is another one of his daughter's bedrooms, and I'm looking around the house, and it's beautiful, and it's also a total mess. And I realized that when Esther said that she had 25 boxes of papers, what she meant was I have some amount of stuff in and around my home. There's things piled on the piano, behind the couch, you know, in plastic tubs next to the washer dryer. Cats are lying down on top of them whenever she's not looking. He's got CDs and a wicker basket in the kitchen, posters from his conferences on the walls. And he's there in nearly every family photo sprinkled among them. And he looks just like a mad scientist, right? Big, white Einstein hair, the kind of stoop stature that us academics get when we spend too much time reading, uh, and this mischievous, toothy grin. And the next day, I wake up and start going through all of it. So, what was there? Uh, I start with the books, books by him and not by him, English, French, German, Spanish, Titles like Theoretical Considerations in Brain Injury Rehabilitation and Non-Synaptic Diffusion Neurotransmission, whatever that means. And sprinkled among them are scientific articles themselves, no alphabetical or chronological order, of course. Sometimes 10 to 15 copies of the same one, just kind of shoved into different places. There's all kinds of general office miscellanea, right, like notes on legal pad and um, typed letters from World War II era scientists who wanted to tell Bakarita they liked what he was doing. Um, and there's all kinds of technology. I mean, there's Betamax and VHS tapes, but I, which I have to confess I never watched because I didn't know how or where to go to do that. <laughs> um, but he, she did also have micro cassette players from the 80s that he used to talk into while he went jogging every morning. And I spent a couple hours trying to get them to work again, and all I could get was that kind of little chipmunk voice, unfortunately. But I could still hear his voice, and he's practicing for his conference proceedings, or he's singing a song he's written about how beautiful his wife Esther is. Um, and Esther also brings me these flash drives and says, oh, maybe these are useful. And they turn out to have the entire contents of his computer, including every email he's ever sent or received. And of course, she gives me his memoirs, half written, maybe three dozen chapters. A chapter could be anything from three sentences to 10 pages. And they 
vary widely in what they cover. I mean, there's stuff about his father growing up in Catalan and Spain, about his own childhood in the 1940s in the Bronx, uh, about hitchhiking across America when he was 17, medical school in Mexico, volunteering in rural villages where people held guns to his head, and then years of research in California and Europe, and then eventually Wisconsin, fighting with people to try to get his ideas recognized. And, uh, you know, I try to go through all these things. I, sometimes I go out to meet other people that he used to work with. I, see one of, I go to one of his patients' houses for tea, and she cries in front of me. I meet up with some of his colleagues, and one of them drags me into his office for four hours to explain in a very thick Russian accent exactly what he thinks they did wrong. Uh, <laughs> I even get to try on the electric lollipop tongue thing, which is exactly as it's been described. I'm strapped in, my eyes closed, a technician is rolling things in front of my face, and I can feel kind of this sensation, sharp but not unpleasant, like champagne or pop rocks, you know? And every day I go back, and I go back through his things, sorting them into different piles, covering them with a tarp at night so the cats don't pee on it, trying to take notes. It takes me almost two weeks to go through everything. And then on one of my last nights, Andrea, the daughter, she invites to take me out in the town to show me downtown Madison. She used to go to college at the university, so she knows all the good spots. We go to three or maybe four bars. I, it's hard to remember. <laughs> and I'm, finally, I'm loosening up. It's a great town. I'm making dumb jokes. I'm knocking back beers. It's the first time in days that I've actually been able to do something other than think about my thesis work. Uh, but Andrea just wants to talk about her dad. She's telling me about how he used to play the piano for her when she was a little girl coming home, and then later when he first was suddenly diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, signed up for this strange new treatment that involved exaggerated doses of chemo and used to come home with the electrodes still on his head and the blood spots around them. And then later when he couldn't even walk and still wanted to go for his morning jog, she would wheel him around the block in, her, in his wheelchair. And I'm trying to take notes on my iPhone whenever she goes to the bathroom so I can try to remember this stuff. And suddenly I stop, like, what am I doing? I mean, this has gone way beyond anything that I would ever need to write down and what I'm working on. Now suddenly this is a man whose life belongs to me. I mean, when I first started doing this work, I wouldn't refer to him as anything but Dr. Baki Rita, to be respectful, you know, like my parents had taught me. And then by the end, I'm calling his siblings on the phone, and I'm referring to him as Paul. I actually dreamed about him. Uh, and as I'm working on it, it just becomes stranger and stranger to me that not only does Paul Baki Rita's life kind of reside with me, but that he has no idea who I am and won't ever know. And I'm thinking about if he was alive and could go through all my things, as he probably has the right to do at this point. I mean, <laughs> the blogs I had when I was 15, the poetry I wrote in high school, the G-chats with my friends, my writing, which I consider so precious and I idealize. Would he know me from that? And I have to think that I feel like I know him. And maybe all that a person is, is the things that they make and what gets left behind and remembered. Or at least I have to hope that that's enough. Thank you. That was Aviva Hope Rutkin. Aviva writes about science and technology for the MIT Technology Review and the Raptor Lab. She has previously interned at Nature Publishing Group, Time, NASA, Brookhaven National Laboratory, and the Marine Biological Laboratory. She studied neuroscience and Chinese at Union College, where she wrote her first thesis on interactive fiction. In the fall, she will graduate with a master's in science writing from MIT. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, and Ari Daniel Shapiro. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Oberon for hosting the show, to WBUR for being wonderful media sponsors, and to Beta and VHS Tapes for keeping secrets. Thanks for listening.
everybody in your crew identifies as either Big Mac Burger, McNuggets, or McCrispy Sandwich. But you're the filet fish Sandwich all day. That crispy fish, that savory tartar sauce, that melty cheese, that pillowy bun. Yeah, you get it. Every time. And if you love the filet of fish right now you can catch two of the classics you love for just $6. Limited time only. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer. Single item at regular price. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba.